Okay, I'm going to keep an eye on the waiting room. We're going to get started. Um, I'd like to introduce Danielle Lerner. Uh, Danielle is a member of the Board of Governors here in the Rocky Mountain Southwest chapter. And um, she, has it been one whole term? Is this your second term? No, uh, well, this you're will finishing be your first second term. Second year, yeah. Second year, okay. Uh, and when um, she, she started out, you're from Phoenix, right? Uh, and then you've been in D.C. and Chicago and California and Tucson, and now you're back uh, in Phoenix, and you anchor the weekends, and you also are a reporter. So we're going to chat the sort of um, 101 kind of reporter things, and we'll let you take the lead, and then we'll, do, we'll save some time for some Q&A &E, Q at the end. <laughs> so if you have any questions, you're welcome to put them in chat, and then I'll get to them in order. Um, and meanwhile, I'm going to mute everybody except Danielle, so you can take it from there. Thank you. All right. Excellent. Thank you so much for the introduction, and thank you, everybody, for uh, tuning in today. I'm excited to uh, go over just some of the things that I've picked up as far as reporting goes um, in the last 12 years or so uh, that I've been doing this. So I do have uh, kind of a little presentation here I'm going to pull up and uh, share my screen with all of you so that uh, we can go through that. Um, and yeah, so some of these things, you know, Laura already mentioned. Um, I work at ABC 15 Arizona. Um, I'm an anchor. I anchor on the weekends there and I um, fill in during the week and then I report during the week as well. So I feel very fortunate. I actually have um, kind of a beat, which is, is kind of unusual, especially in broadcast these days. Um, but I tend to focus on education. So that's been uh, really exciting getting to um, kind of focus on a particular issue and make contacts and, um, you know, cover an issue that's very near and dear to me as well as somebody who grew up here um, and who's excited to be back home. So I just wanted to start off, this is just a little bit about my background. Um, I, I get the question quite often, you know, did you study journalism in school? Where did you go to school? Um, I actually went to St. Mary's College in South Bend, Indiana. It's a, a sister school of Notre Dame. And I did not know what I wanted to do at all. And so I thought, hey, you know, I'll major in communications, mass communications. I love to write, so I'll study English writing as well. And we'll just kind of see where that goes. Um, and originally, I actually considered law school. And then I took a look at the LSAT and thought, yeah, there's, there's just no way that that's going to work for me. Um, and so actually, my mom recommended one summer when I was home to do an internship. And she said, you know, I think you would be great at it. You love to story tell you're great um, at, at meeting people and um, I just think you'd be great. So I actually interned at Fox 10 in 2005 um, on their morning show and um, throughout some of their day parts and I just really fell in love with it and so that's when I knew okay this is what I want to do. Um, my undergraduate didn't really have a very strong, they actually didn't have a journalism program, they had a couple of journalism classes, um, but no real program. And so I decided that I wanted to go to graduate school to get more of that practical hands-on learning um, that, you know, especially here at ASU and, and a lot of other schools are now providing in a really big way. So I went to Northwestern University. I got a master's of science in journalism there with a specialization in broadcast. And once I was done there, I went off to my uh, first market, which was in San Luis Obispo, California. Uh, market 122 sandwiched right in between San Francisco and Los Angeles for anyone who isn't familiar with that area. Uh, fantastic first market, not just because we lived right by the beach, but uh, it was a small market, but they had a lot of big, big issues. Uh, wildfires were big, a lot of political stuff being California. Um, so I got a lot of great experience um, right out of the gate, which was fantastic. Uh, from there, I went to Tucson, Arizona. I was the morning anchor there for three years, and I uh, loved my time in Tucson, but always kind of saw that as my ticket to come back home uh, to Phoenix. And thankfully, uh, very grateful it worked out that way, and coming up on six years now at ABC 15. I've done several different positions at ABC. I've done morning anchoring. Um, I anchor weekend evenings right now. Um, I've general assignment reported. I, I focus on education now. So uh, there's been a lot that has happened during my time, even just here in Phoenix. And just down there at the bottom, I've kind of, you know, done every position there is in the newsroom. A lot, that's really what your first job likely will entail. And it's been wonderful um, from anchoring and reporting to I even did weather in my first market. 
um, you know, shooting, editing, all of the above. And so um, I feel fortunate that I had that experience. Um, when we talk about reporting, and I know there's a lot of words on this, on this uh, slide here, but I really started thinking about the types of reporters that we have in our newsroom right now at ABC 15. And so this might look different at different stations, but especially now, uh, it's no longer just kind of the traditional reporter that you think of out in the field with their photographer asking questions with the microphone. Um, you know, we have all of these different types of reporters in our newsroom. So there's the multimedia journalist. That's the person who's out there shooting their own interviews, uh, writing their own work, editing their own work, usually on a daily deadline, but they're very self-contained. So they can get a story, um, they can function and do everything on their own without ever really going into the newsroom. Um, general assignment, kind of, kind of the same uh, MO as the MMJ, except usually that reporter will work with a photographer, so you'll have a team um, of folks. Uh, here in Phoenix, you know, at our station, we are fortunate that most of our reporters do get to work with a photographer, but there are still some who do have to MMJ on a daily basis. And so knowing how to do that and almost expecting how uh, that you will have to do that at some point, I think is important, especially as you're going into your first market. Uh, we have an enterprise and investigative team. That was something new that our uh, new, well, relatively new news director, he's been there about a year and a half now, but he created this uh, enterprise team and I'm included in that. And basically there are about six or seven of us and we all focus on longer form, more in-depth work. And so this is beyond kind of the daily crime, uh, the daily press releases that come out, daily news. These are uh, bigger issues. So we have our investigative team and they do really in-depth uh, investigations. Um, I focus on education. Uh, we have someone who focuses on roads and road safety, someone who focuses on law enforcement. And so the goal there is maybe we're not doing stories every day, but we are able to get into those deeper issues that you just can't cover in a minute and 30 seconds when you start working on it at 9 a.m. and expect to have it at 4 p.m. Um, so that's been pretty amazing uh, what our news director has put in place and the work that we've been able to do because we have those resources um, at that time. Uh, we do have a political reporter, and actually we call him our data guru. Um, sometimes our data guru, Garrett, <laughs> will appear um, on air, but a lot of times, um, you know, both of them are just on the ground talking to people, doing interviews, um, doing research. Sometimes they'll write things up and have reporters or uh, anchors voice them, kind of more of a producer role. But this allows us to have one person who focuses pretty much entirely on the capital and what's going on policy-wise, uh, legislation-wise. And then the data part of that, Garrett is able to look into numbers. Like with everything going on right now with COVID-19, he has been uh, really looking into the case numbers and the testing numbers, and he's been able to pull stories out of that uh, that maybe some of the rest of us who aren't familiar with that process wouldn't be able to see and wouldn't be able to do. Um, so that's been a great asset to our station as well. And then we have a whole team, uh, I believe there are four or five of them, of digital only reporters. And they put content together only for abc15.com. Some of our, uh, we call it OTT, over the top platforms. So these are things you might see streaming on Roku um, or other streaming devices. Um, and they tend to cover more community central content. So entertainment, we have Josh, who covers restaurants and big events that are happening throughout the community. Uh, we have Joe, who focuses on crime. And so he's in there just about every day, uh, pulling courses and looking through what happened and, you know, really that type of legwork that maybe those of us who are trying to turn stories on a daily basis wouldn't have the time to do. Um, and then now we're starting to see some crossover between our digital team and our on-air team. Josh has done some live shots for us uh, from the fair when the fair was in town and some other events that have been happening. So there really is so much room um, for so many different types of reporters in one newsroom. And so I, I think that's important to keep in mind as you think about, you know, what type of journalism you may be interested in and um, you know, what type of outlet or what type of a focus you might be interested in. And then I put this line at the bottom, strong reporters make strong anchors, because uh, I've, I've had several people ask me, you know, as an anchor, um, 
you know, why can't I just go straight to anchoring? Or do you think I could go straight to anchoring in my first market? And while, yes, I do think people can go straight to anchoring in their first market, um, I have been told time and time again that line that strong reporters make strong anchors. And I can tell you from personal experience, you know, having been an anchor now for about 10 of my 12 years in the business, I think I have been at my best when I have also been out in the community reporting and talking to people. When you have that connection with people, when you have that understanding of your community, uh, when you know the issues and you know who to speak with about those issues, uh, it, it only makes you that much stronger and that much more credible on the desk. And so I always like to remind people that even if you're an anchor, you are still uh, expected to be and you still should be a, a strong reporter as well. Uh, this is something that I, in hindsight, wish that I would have known about when I went into my very first market. The idea of sourcing and making those connections with folks who can give you story ideas, who can weigh in on complex issues, um, and just kind of keep you updated on what's happening in the community. And it's taken me a long time to actually develop this. I mean, I would say probably in the last few years, honestly, have I really felt like I've been able to cultivate some of these relationships. Um, and so first off, you know, you're gonna have your official sources. And so this was something I didn't even really know when I first started. And um, I'm sure things have, have come a long way as far as what we're learning in the classroom now. But, you know, every law enforcement agency, every organization will have a public information officer or a PIO as we call them. Um, lawmakers, other local leaders, uh, in the community, executives of companies. These are people who will be able to give you the facts of something that happened. If it's a crime story, they'll be able to tell you what happened. Um, if it's a, a local leader, they'll be able to tell you about certain initiatives that might be going on in your community. Um, this is information that anybody who asks is probably going to receive the exact same information. And these are the faces of their organization. So uh, these are folks who you're gonna go to mainly for um, information as opposed to emotion, as opposed to insight, as opposed to feeling on an issue. But they're very important because once you figure out you know, who's who, um, it makes it a lot easier when you're on a deadline and you need to contact someone. So that's something that I've heard of uh, people doing even before they get to a market. If they're moving jobs or if they're going to their first market, They'll start looking at, you know, your big agencies in a city or an area. And, you know, you can kind of find those folks' names, their contact information pretty easily. And they'll make contact either before they get to that market or once they get there just to introduce themselves. Um, and so that they're almost kind of a familiar face the first time they show up asking questions. Uh, subject matter sources. I think that this is something that I way underutilized in the last you know, decade or so. Um, in my mind, especially when you are working on that tight deadline, you tend to think of a source as, okay, who can I put on camera to answer this question for me, get the interview, and then move on so I can put it together. Um, but I have met several people through a variety of different uh, outlets, whether it's um, like education conferences or in doing stories on a school or talking to parents. Um, who I go to when it comes to um, complex subject matter that I may not understand. For instance, we did a whole series on uh, the Mesa public school superintendent last November. Um, she was put on paid administrative leave. Nobody would say why at first. And so I had somebody who I'd met on a previous story regarding Mesa public schools who I went to and said, First off, do you know anything about this? Second of all, we're hearing there might be something with the budget, but I have no idea how to read a school district budget. And if you've ever tried to look at one, it's incredibly overwhelming. Um, and so this person, you know, never really appeared on air, but was able to walk me through that. Uh, okay, this is where you want to look for things. This is what this line item means. Um, you know, just a really good person to contact with questions where you're not necessarily looking for an interview, you're literally just looking for information. Um, and that can help on a variety of topics and can help lead you in the direction to find the right person to interview. And then there's deep sources. And I think these are the stereotypical, you know, getting your phone call in the middle of the night of somebody who 
has a big scoop that they're only going to give to you. Um, they're out there. I, I can't take credit for it, but there, there's one reporter, at least in our newsroom, who he is, he is incredible at sourcing. And he has some of those sources who will call him in the middle of the night when something big is happening and, and he'll have the exclusive on it. And, you know, that is something that takes a lot of time uh, to develop. You know, you're not, you can't just meet somebody one day and then start calling them and saying, hey, can you tell me something that you're not going to tell somebody else? Um, but a lot of that is follow-up. It's, you know, staying in contact. Um, you know, some of the folks that I work with as far as in education, who I work with quite often, um, you know, I've developed good relationships with them where, you know, they know that if I ask for an interview that there might be hard questions, but they know it's going to be fair. Or, you know, I'm, I might be more willing to highlight, um, you know, a, a great program that they're rolling out because I know that if something happens and I need to uh, ask questions that they might be more inclined to come to me first, which has happened uh, before. But again, it's, it, there, those are few and far between. If you have a handful of them, you are doing a lot better than most folks. Um, and that just takes a lot of time um, and, and trust, honestly, to develop. Uh, this is something that um, Zach, one of our reporters, I cannot take credit for this either, but he is fantastic at sourcing. And I, re I went to him one day and I said, okay, you know, they're having me report more. How do I, how can I reach more people? How can I develop my own, you know, little Rolodex quickly? And so he, it, this sounds simple and forgive me if you already know how to do it. But on your phone, he said, every single person you meet, whether you interview them or you, whether you don't, it doesn't matter put them in your phone and under the company, put keywords. So, um, you know, for instance, like you'll see here, I've put education. So now in my phone, if I type in education, all these people will come up who are affiliated with education. Um, that helps a lot if you're looking for, for instance, I talk to a lot of parents and parents can be hard to track down. Um, and so literally every single one I've talked to, I'll put the school and I'll put parent. That way I know, okay, I need parents for this. I'll go into my phone and boom, a whole list will pop up. And so that has been incredibly helpful uh, for me, not necessarily in creating, um, you know, deep sources, but people who I know are well-versed in a certain subject matter, who I might need to talk to on a regular basis, uh, I know exactly where to find them. And so that has been something that's been very helpful. Uh, when it comes to story ideas, that's another question that I get. And honestly, it's something, again, that has taken me several years, I think, to, to actually develop to a point where I, I think I've, I'm competent <laughs> in developing, you know, good stories um, and pitching them. So, you know, your story ideas literally will come from anywhere. You know, they can come from some of those sources. Um, they can come from social media, especially, you know, Facebook now and Twitter and Instagram, uh, Nextdoor apps, you know, all these community groups, community pages, those are great spots to find what people are speaking about, especially in a specific area or on a certain topic. Those can be very helpful. Um, you know, something you observe, something random that kind of catches your eye and you think, oh, I wonder what that is. You never know, go look into it. Um, PR pitches, you know, a lot of times those obviously are gonna have an agenda to them, but there are times when they can maybe highlight an issue that you hadn't thought about. And so finding a way to turn it into a story that might have more appeal beyond just highlighting a certain organization or a certain business can work. Uh, following up on previous stories, uh, your daily interactions at the grocery store, at wherever you are, just talking to people can give you story ideas. And then family and friends as well. You know, I always, I kind of joke that I have my own little uh, we're out here in the East Valley, my own little East Valley Moms Focus Group, because I can just, you know, chat with them. Hey, you know, how, how are the kids doing with school being out? How are you doing? You know, what are some of your concerns? And kind of using that as, okay, well, if they're experiencing that, then other people probably are. So let's look into it. Uh, these screen grabs that I put here on the right are just a few stories that came from uh, various places. So the Valley Occupational Therapist Treating Consequences of Too Much Screen Time for Kids. That story came out of uh, my daughter's music class. We go to a little music class once a week and her teacher kept talking about how she's noticing when kids come into music class that they're having more trouble with fine motor skills than they used to. 
And that, you know, a lot of it is because of the increase in screen time. And she said it probably two or three times before I thought, you know what, I'm going to look, I'm going to look into that. So sure, I called a few, um, you know, occupational therapy groups here in town who, who work with young children. And they said, yeah, I mean that it's because of, uh, you know, they're not moving and they're not using their finger rate that they use. Posture is different and they don't know how to interact with other people as well. And so that's where that story kind of and the, a whole almost minute on that. And we were actually able to follow it up with um, a gift given for parents, because this was around the holidays, of good interactive toys that will help to develop some of those fine motor skills. So we actually got two stories out of my out of my daughter's music class teacher, which was great. Um, the one there at the bottom, the criminal complaint involving Mesa Public Schools uh, filed with the AG's office. So that was during the whole Mesa uh, superintendent, that ongoing story. I think we did probably 10 or 11 stories all centered around that issue. Um, and the person, we were the first people to have that. I was the only one to have it when it, it came out that night. And the person who filed that complaint was somebody who I had just happened to randomly talk to for a story about three months earlier about the bond uh, or about the override election for Mesa Public Schools. And we had made that connection and I had, I had talked to him a little bit here and there just about random stuff. Um, but because of that initial interview that we did, they felt comfortable, gave it to us and we were um, you know, the first ones to have it. Uh, so that came out of a previous story and just kind of a relationship that developed uh, from there. And then the other one about school counselors. So this was one that we did recently during uh, the pandemic while we're all working remotely. And uh, we had done a story, it was last year, Mesa Public Schools had added 35 elementary counselors, which was a big deal because the counselor ratios here in Arizona are double the national average and actually the worst in the nation. We have just over 900 students to every counselor. Um, and so the fact that they got 35 new counselors was huge. And so we went out, we did a story uh, with one particular counselor, her name's Jamie Clemens, and she's fantastic. And she was super excited because now she only has 700 kids that she's responsible for instead of 1,400. And so, you know, we did a whole story with her. She was great. Well, fast forward now, schools are closed. Everyone's doing remote learning. And I started thinking about, well, how are school counselors reaching their students, you know, having been there with Jamie for the day and seeing what they do. I mean, how do you reach those kids virtually? And so, you know, I talked with my photographer about it and we thought, you know what, it's going to be a struggle to get video because we can't get onto school campuses. We can't go to anybody's house to interview them. Um, so what we did is I reached back out to Jamie and I said, Hey, you know, how are you doing this? And she talked to us all about, um, you know, how she's trying to call her students every day. She's worried about her students. And we were able, it was actually a cool juxtaposition because we were able to, to use the video from when we had shot it before with her on campus. And then now we were able to, um, you know, show her doing it from home essentially through Zoom. And so that was, you know, it was a good follow-up story. Um, and from something I had observed from being there and watching her, her do, you know what she does so well and so those are just a few examples of how various story ideas uh, come to life okay so once you have your your story idea making your pitch that's another thing that um, i think everybody can always improve on and a lot of what i think and again this is just my personal opinion what i think makes a good pitch is something that's well researched and something that you know is doable which might sound obvious. Um, but I'm guilty of it too. When you are on a daily, you know, a daily reporting schedule and you're expected to have three story ideas every morning when you walk in, sometimes you just pick something and say, well, I'll figure it out later. But you know, this is what I'm going to pursue now. And yes, you can get by that way, but it makes life a lot easier on yourself if you've already kind of done a little bit of digging beforehand. Um, so first off, you know, you, you have your story idea, uh, do your research and narrow your focus. So is this going to be a story where you're taking action? You're trying to, to get a resolution for someone. Uh, you're raising awareness about something, um, you, you know, whether it's a cause or an issue. So think about, okay, 
what is going to be the purpose of this story? And does it work for your outlet? So if you're, especially if you're working in TV, if you're doing a story that doesn't really lend itself to any video, that's going to be tough to tell that story. Whereas, you know, if you're in print, maybe it's something that is better written versus visual. Um, think about your deadline and think about your resources. You know, if you're, if you know you have to have a story in by 4.30 and it's 9 a.m., you're probably not going to be able to do, to tackle a really big in-depth issue. You know, if you're shooting something by yourself, that presents its own challenges than if you're working with a photographer. So think about all of those elements as well. And who do you need to hear from and can they talk to you? Um, this is, I think, one of the hardest, most stressful parts especially in your first job, going to work, not necessarily knowing what story you're going to do or who you're going to need to talk to, and then finding out at 930 and then calling those people and hoping that they're available to fit you in and do an interview within the strength you need. That is, that is one of the most stressful for me anyway. And so, you know, even just if you keep a running list of some story ideas, have some time shoot an email to someone who, who may be with an organization that you're looking at uh, featuring. And, hey, I'm working on this. Would you have, when's your availability? You know, just to get an idea so that you can think, okay, well, to pitch this story because I know this person is available. I just have to call them and we'll get going. So that, that makes it easier. Um, also, the whole issue of can they talk to you, um, you know, if it's something that's, is concerning uh, protected information or you know this happens in law enforcement a lot you know they they just can't tell you certain things and so if you are pitching a story based on information they can't tell you that's going to be an issue so just all things to keep when you're developing your your pitch and then uh, once you get through those things you know why does this matter why is this important to the people in your community um, again, what's the point? Are you taking action? Are you raising awareness? Are you just offering some hope? Are you trying to uh, highlight some good that's going on in our community? Are you trying to inform people, maybe break down a complex topic or localize a national issue to let people know why that issue is important to them? Um, have, have those interviewees set up and ready to go and think about how you might tell the story in a unique way. Uh, for instance, that story on the counselor, we could have just chosen, uh, you know, any counselor, gone to the school counselors association, asked for them to give us someone. Everyone understands right now we're on, we're zooming and, you know, video is scary. Um, but, you know, we chose to kind of do it in a, in a different way. And so I think that that um, not only helps you grow as a reporter, but um, kind of benefits your, your outlet as a whole when you bring that creativity and some of that uniqueness to the stories that you do. Um, when it comes to actually interviewing, um, you know, there's, there's kind of two different types of uh, that you can expect to do. There's scheduled interviews. Um, they could be scheduled in advance. They could be scheduled a week in advance. Um, but these interviews know coming. You know who you're talking to. You know we're going to be shooting the interview. Everything is kind of in this controlled environment, so to speak. Um, which is great because you have time to, you know, do your research on the person you're going to be interviewing and on the topic and maybe thinking about the questions that, you know, might work for this particular person or this particular position. Um, warm up the conversation. People, and I can't blame them because, you know, if I were in their shoes, I would be nervous as well. People can be great just one-on-one -on -one, and then the second you turn a camera on or a light, it becomes very intimidating and very overwhelming. And so anything you can do to just kind of, you know, loosen them up or, you know, I always try to start by just, you know, hey, you know, how are things, how are things going for you? Oh yeah, you know, and just small talk, lots and lots of small talk. Um, you know, if they have kids, I'll bring up my kids and we'll just chat while the photographer is setting things up um, and just reiterating to them, you know, this isn't a live interview. We're gonna edit this together. The point of the story is this. You know, I'm gonna ask you questions like this. And I notice that tend that helps a lot. And many people say afterwards, well, you, you know, you made me feel so comfortable. And so that's what you want because somebody who's comfortable with you is going to talk to you a lot more than someone who's uncomfortable. 
Um, and yeah, just keep it simple, walk them through the process and follow up with them too. You know, like I said, put them in your phone with a keyword, maybe circle back when the story airs. I always send a link to the story that went online uh, to the person that I interviewed just as a way to say, hey, thanks for your help. This is the story that came together. And it's a good way to just kind of touch base um, and keep them in your contacts. Uh, the other type is more uh, kind of an unexpected um, the MOS, the man on the street, and then door knocking. So these are things where, you know, let's say there's an issue going to the city council about uh, parking fines. I just made that up off the top of my head. But, uh, you know, and you have to go out and talk to uh, drivers about what they think about this. So that's gonna be your, your MOS. They're not necessarily associated with an organization, but they, it's something that impacts them. They have a stake in it, and so you wanna hear their opinion to get a gauge on how people might be feeling about this, this move. Um, door knocks, those are, to me, those are a little more intimidating. Usually if you're knocking on somebody's door, it's because they didn't answer your phone calls or your emails um, and you're, you know, you're trying to ask them some tough questions, um, or there might have just been an emergency situation, uh, a crime may have happened, a tragedy may have happened, and you're going to their door, uh, again, to ask them hard questions. So starting with the, the man on the street, you know, I always say your surroundings matter. So for instance, if you were doing the story on, uh, you know, the city of Phoenix upping their um, parking tickets, you're going to want to go to a city parking lot and talk to people who are using it around it and may have a stake in it. Um, if you're looking for, you know, parents or uh, moms, let's just say, for instance, school supplies. When we, when we ask people about school supply shopping, a lot of times we go to the target parking lot because you know, there's going to be, <laughs> there's going to be parents there and around school, back to school time, they're probably buying school supplies. Um, grocery store parking lots are also great because you have a lot of people going in and out. Um, you know, they have to stop at their car to put stuff in. So it's, it's easier to, to kind of talk to people that way. Um, obviously safety first. Uh, you don't want to approach uh, anybody you don't feel comfortable approaching. If somebody says no, then I, especially with, you know, MOS, totally get it. Thanks. Have a great day. You know, I'm not going to push anybody to talk to me on camera. Uh, when I've literally just walked up to them in the middle of their day, you know, doing whatever they were doing, um, I'm not gonna not gonna push that. Um, again, looking for a connection, you know, some I'm I'll be totally honest. For parents, and we're in a parking lot. I've looked at car uh, bumper stickers, the ones that say, you know, I'm a proud parent at you know wherever, or the little stickers on the backs of the vans with the family. I'm saying, okay, well they have kids, so if that person comes out. I'm gonna ask them, um, kind of choosing, being more efficient, I guess we could say. Um, compassion over competition, that's always my, my rule of thumb, um, especially if we're talking about uh, door knocks in particular, those tend to be very sensitive situations. Um, you know, in my first market, there was actually a situation where um, a family had just found out the day before that their son had, um, been killed in Afghanistan. He was a soldier. And so uh, our news director, you know, sent me down to their house to knock on their door and to talk to them about losing their son. And I wasn't the only reporter. There were several other reporters there. Uh, and they said, you know, thanks, but no thanks. And completely understand, you know, so sorry for your loss. Um, and my, my news director at the time, this was in California, uh, was really pushing and just thinking, you know, well, if, if they are on the other station, you know, we're not going to have it and really pushing that competitive aspect. Um, and my photographer and I agreed that we, we didn't want to go that route. We didn't want to stick a camera in their face and knock on their door again and ask them to talk about their son who had just died. And so what I did is, you know, my photographer stayed in the car. I went back up to the door by myself and I just, you know, said, Hey, you know, I'm so sorry to bother you. Um, but we just want to make sure that people know who your son was, the incredible sacrifice that he made. And she let me into her house and we probably sat there for 45 minutes just talking and she was crying and she's showing me all these pictures and, um, you know, just connecting really. And uh, at the end of all of it, she said, okay, you know, I, I feel comfortable with you. I, I will talk to you. 
And so they ended up doing an interview with us. And, you know, it wasn't as, a, as emotional as she had been with me earlier, but um, I think she appreciated that compassion and that, that time to acknowledge their incredible loss and to really explain why we wanted to talk to her about it. Um, and so I've really tried to keep that with me. You know, that was over 10 years ago now. I've really tried to keep that with me whenever I approach somebody because, you know, especially if it's a MOS or a door knock, this is somebody that either wasn't expecting you or didn't want to talk to you to begin with. So very important, I think, to be compassionate. Um, and then bracing for confrontation. I am awful with confrontation. I will walk away from it at all costs. I really, really dislike confrontation. However, uh, and this sounds super cheesy, but I would say, well, yeah, but you know, I'm wearing my reporter hat, so game on. It's kind of, you know, you kind of have to put yourself in that mindset of, you know, me as a person wouldn't just walk up to the governor and say, hey, you know, why haven't you uh, released more numbers on testing? Like that's, that's not something that I would do as Danielle. But if I'm working in a journalism, uh, you know, the journalism environment, and I'm asking those questions for our viewers, well, that's different. And so for me, that helps me feel more comfortable with that confrontation aspect, is to remember, you know, this doesn't make you a bad person. You're not being rude. You're not hurting anybody's feelings. Uh, you are doing your job. And that's part of the job. Now you can be, you can kind of taper the way that you confront people. You know, I tend to be, um, again, more on the kind of compassionate. Um, I will be very kind. You know, I won't kind of be super aggressive. Um, but, you know, that's also why I'm not an investigative reporter. Our investigative reporters are very aggressive and that's why they get amazing things done. And so it's okay if you don't have that, you know, instinct to just run and put microphones in people's faces. That's okay. But I can guarantee you at some time or another that confrontation is going to come into play in your work. Um, I, I was thinking about, you know, all of the platforms that we have now. Uh, when I first started, it was, okay, yeah, your story airs on the newscast, and then a link will go up on the website, and that's pretty much it. Now, yes, of course, it airs during the daily newscast. We've got Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, LinkedIn. Um, there are so many stations across the country doing incredible podcasts. Um, you know, this the station or your outlet's website, obviously, uh, your sister stations. I mean, our stories are shared with the entire Scripps network. Um, and there's a lot of stations all across the country who might pick up our stories. And same with us picking up their stories. Um, OTT, that's called Over the Top. So that's your Roku, your streaming devices, um, our ABC15 app. Sometimes they have special content that goes on the app that doesn't go other places. Our station has a YouTube channel, blogs. Uh, so just something to keep in mind as you're doing stories that it's not, air isn't the final product necessarily. I mean, it could end up on all these other platforms. And so that's just something to think about when you're uh, pitching ideas and when you're thinking about how to put it together. And then this was just something, um, it actually came from a previous presentation I did once on on-camera presence. I asked some of my coworkers uh, some of their advice that they would have for students on how to improve their on-camera presence and how to be confident um, in what they're doing. And, uh, you know, you can read, there's, there's several different responses here, but I think the biggest one that I, I tend to take away uh, from all of them is, you know, knowing what you're talking about, being confident in it, you know, not just reading, um, especially if you're angry, not just reading a script, but really understanding your subject matter um, and making it feel like you are just talking to that person in their living room, in the way you write, in the way you shoot a stand-up, in the way you introduce your piece. Um, you know, you're not talking to the hundreds of thousands or, you know, million people who are watching. Um, think of it as just one person and connecting with that person. Um, so there's some other ones in there too, like wear solids to avoid distractions. That's always a good one. Um, but that's something that you could always um, go back and take a look at. And that was all I had prepared. So, um, I would be happy to take any questions, uh, comments, anything at all. So um, I'll turn things over to uh, Laura. Okay. Um, I'll wait for questions in the chat. I think there's few enough people here. If you would like to unmute and jump in uh, with your mic, that's okay too. 
my first question just to get started is um, what do you think about anchoring in the field versus anchoring in the studio? Are there any, um, I know this is mainly about recording, but that's a skill that is different. Would you want to chat about that for a second? Sure, yes. Um, so anchoring in the field, uh, it, it, I think it takes almost two different skill sets. So anchoring in studio, it can be, um, you know, there's still that pressure and wanting to make sure that you are uh, knowledgeable in what you're talking about because if technology fails or if something happens, you have to be ready to be able to jump in. Uh, when you're in the field, I think that that goes to a whole new level. And that's where I think solid recording skills come in as well. So. Um, I know for me, you know, being a reporter and having to do live shots in the field quite often and intro pieces in the field and talk to people all the time help me when I am field anchoring because you're not sitting there staring at a prompter. You kind of have to go off the cuff a little more. And a lot of that is knowledge and confidence. And those are things that I think you gain um, when you're out in the field reporting. Are there any other questions? I have a question actually. Yeah. So I was wondering if you do an interview with someone and you end up not using any of that interview footage, how do you, in the final cut, how do you go about feeling like you didn't waste their time almost? That's a great question. Um, I have, that has happened to me. And what I usually do is I will tell them first off, because I don't want them to be watching and then not see themselves and uh, be super disappointed. Um, but I will always tag it with, but you know what, we might use it as a, at a future date, uh, okay. which, which we have done before, you know, especially with, with school stories and things. If there's, um, you know, a parent or a story that I just couldn't get to, but we already did an interview, sometimes I can recycle that and repurpose it for something else. Cool, awesome. I have another one too. I'm sorry. I was yeah, writing no. things down as you went along. Um, when did you feel like it was time for you to switch circuits or switch location? When did that time come in your career that you just felt that? Yeah, that's a, I love that question too. So um, a lot of times when you're first starting out, there's the idea of, okay, you do two years at your first station, then you move on. Then you do, you know, two or three years, then you move on. And kind of this idea of this timeline that you have to follow. Um, but I think what you're saying is right on. Sometimes it comes down to when you're ready um, and what opportunities come your way. So for instance, my first market, I signed a um, you know, two-year contract, planned on only being there two years and then being done. Um, but throughout my time there, I wound up getting the weekend anchor job. I wound up really loving it there. And so I spent three and a half years there. Um, when I knew that I was ready to, to move on, there's a couple things. And this is just something I know about myself. I'm sure you have, you know, tendencies that you know about yourself. Mm -hmm. Once I started, you know, not really wanting to go in anymore on the weekends, once I started feeling just really overwhelmed to the point where I was kind of, um, you know, kind of doing the minimum to get by, I wasn't really going above and beyond as much anymore. Um, and just feeling very, uh, kind of in like on a wheel of just doing the same thing all the time, not learning anymore, um, not really seeing any more opportunities for me there. Uh, that was when I knew it was time to leave. And it also uh, had to be the right opportunity. In my mm -hmm. first market, um, I had actually, I always joke that they tried to trade me to our station in Texas because I got a random email from the news director there saying that they were excited that I was interested in their anchor position and I had mm. no idea what they were talking about. Um, and so I went to a Corpus Christi, Texas and interviewed and I just, I just didn't feel like it was the right fit for me and I turned them down and they thought I was crazy, um, but respected my decision. Well, fast forward, you know, five months later and there was a posting for a job in Tucson and I just saw yes. it and I just knew that's where I have to go because that'll get me closer to home and it all worked out. So I think it's a combination of knowing your own ambitions, your own personality and having the right opportunity to leave for. Cool. Awesome. Thank yeah, you. Of course. Do we have any other questions either in the uh, chat I have a question. Hi Chuck. Hey Chuck. Hi. Hello. Hello. Hey, great presentation. Thank you so much. Oh, um, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about your relationship with uh, your videographers? I know that's a close working relationship uh, professionally in order to gather stories like that. But uh, 
talk a little bit about what that's like in order to have a successful uh, relationship with your videographer. Yes, that is a great question because there are times I get along great with, with all of our videographers and I joke, oh, thank goodness we get along because spending you know eight to 10 hours with you in a small car would be a lot worse <laughs> if we didn't get along. Um, and I, I think I, I learned this starting in my first market is there's got to be you know that respect there. There's no uh, hierarchy by any means. Um, and I think having been an MMJ, I understand what goes into shooting and editing. And I'm the first to admit that I cannot do it as well as somebody who that's what they do. That's what they specialize in. Um, as far as, you know, working well together, I think it's important to feel out everybody's personalities. Um, I know we have some videographers who uh, prefer that I just kind of give them a, hey, you know, this is what I'm thinking of for this story. These are the elements that I think we, I think would help tell the story. And then once we get there, it's, it's them. They don't really like to be, to feel micromanaged. They don't want me kind of saying, Hey, did you get this shot? Get this shot. I have others who are the exact opposite. They like when we're there for me to say, Oh, Hey, did you get this gnat sound? Did you get this clip? Did you, you know, kind of uh, be a little more hands-on. And so I think feeling that out of, of what everybody prefers as far as, um, how they like to do their workflow um, and uh, you know playing to each other's strengths I think is a big one you know I know some of our videographers um, love doing nap packages they're all about including natural sound in their pieces and I have other ones who like to focus more on visually on different on getting different angles for interviews or you know different points of view for things and so all sometimes if I'm selecting stories to do for the day I might pick one of the photographers who I know, hey, this could be a really good, um, you know, sounding story. We're going to a music class. I want to go with uh, Chad if possible, because I know he loves to incorporate sound. Um, and I think too, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to get along super great with every, everybody, you know, there's always going to be uh, some com some conflict, especially, you know, it can be a really high stress, um, high stress story, high stress environment. And so understanding that if, if you do have an off day with that person, that it's okay, um, but not letting it linger, you know? So kind of going back to those, those tips for just communicating well of, you know, addressing any concerns. Um, and there's one, there's one other one that I was going to say that I, see that. oh yes. Um, something else that I learned as an intern uh, one of the photographers at Fox 10 told me, always offer to carry the photographer's equipment. <laughs> and it sounds really silly. I still do that. Even when I was out reporting nine months pregnant, I always offered. I knew they would say no, but it's something that kind of breaks the ice and they feel appreciated and, you know, seen. Um, and so just, you know, making sure that you're you're showing them that you value what they bring to the table and that yes, could I go out and shoot and edit an entire story by myself? Sure. Is it going to be as good as if I have one of our photographers working with me? No. And so always making sure that they know that. Uh, thank you. I guess that's good advice about helping to carry equipment. I, I mm -hmm. heard a re, uh, photographer one time said, you know, part of the word reporter is porter. So yeah. <laughs> what you're saying uh, resonates. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It goes a long way. Do we Thank have you. any other questions? I've got one more, if that's all right. You can ask as many as you want. <laughs> awesome, awesome. So I was just wondering, for those of us going into college next year, um, this will be a pretty new experience for me because my school didn't actually have a journalism program. And I'm very thankful for Laura and her family who have really kind of taken me under their wing in that retrospect these years. But um, what would you say going into college was something you maybe wish you would have known before you went to journalism school, even for your master's? Something I wish I would have known, like as far as like a subject matter or something that I wish I would have done? Maybe something you wish you would have done okay. or both, either or. <laughs> yeah, sure. Let, let's go for both. Why not, right? Um, I think as far as, you know, subject matter, I, I think I could have, um, Maybe, maybe it pursued more storytelling, like a storytelling class or two, 
um, because we didn't really have a journalism program, you know, I was kind of just piecing stuff together. Um, but I think storytelling is huge. And then when I was in graduate school, um, the video production class was actually one of my favorite classes. Um, and I think even if you want to be on air, the more you can learn about the production aspect and what goes into making that happen, um, I think can only only serve you well. Things I wish I would have done, uh, we did have like a campus TV station. And I think I probably in hindsight would have benefited from, you know, being involved in that um, just to kind of get more experience and, and more reps. But I, I feel like I was uh, lucky to have some really great internships that helped with that. Awesome. And what do you think going into your first job, what was your actual title as an intern or title in your job? And what do you think, what, what do most people who are brand new to the field go right into straight out of college, to be honest? Sure. So, th so for me, again, this was like 12 years ago, so <laughs> things may have changed a little bit. Um, because, you know, we do have, when I was in Tucson, we had people coming right out of Cronkite as reporters. You know, in Tucson's a mid-level market. That's not, that's not a small space. And so um, I do tend to, you know, tell people it's very beneficial to start in that small market because a lot of it too isn't just knowing how to do everything, but it's the confidence in having confidence in yourself that you're capable of doing it. Um, and so that's why I think small markets are fantastic for that. You make mistakes, everyone there is in the same boat, everyone's kind of expecting you to make mistakes, and there's much more of a mentor relationship that happens in those smaller markets, uh, which I think are great. I actually started as a bureau reporter. So our main station was in San Luis Obispo and I worked in our bureau, which was about 30 miles south. So I just started as a GA bureau reporter and then worked my way up from there. Um, I would say most, well, again, it's, it's kind of hard to say because some may go into like a, a weekend anchor role, maybe out of school. Um, but I would say going, going in as a full-time on-air GA reporter is usually uh, the, the track that most take right out of college. Great. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed your presentation, by the way. It was awesome to hear. Oh, I'm so glad. Yeah. Anytime you have questions, do not hesitate to reach out. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So uh, Danielle, we're gonna, we've recorded this. We're gonna make it available on our YouTube page for the other chapters and for kids who couldn't make it at this time. Is there Great. anything else you would like to share that we didn't touch on or any parting thought? Um, I think something else that I, I have learned in my you know, 12 years in the business is even if you have a path that you think is your path that you are set to, that you are dedicated to, um, you know, if, if you're going into your first job thinking, you know, I'll be here two years, then I'm going to move up to be an anchor and then I'm going to go to network and I'm going to be on the Today Show. That's great. And that, that may happen for you. Um, but also to just be open to other opportunities that come along the way, because you just never know, especially now with things changing so much and so many different outlets and opportunities, you just don't know, uh, what's going to come your way. And that's something that, I've experienced myself, you know, I was always set on being a morning anchor in Phoenix. And, you know, I did that for a little bit. And now I'm in my current role. And I'm, I'm actually really enjoying the current opportunities that I have, you know, I mean, being able to be dedicated to a certain issue. Um, you know, with with a family, this new, this new, um, you know, dynamic works really well for our family. And it's something that I probably would not have considered had it not been something that I kind of had to do. And so I think that was a really big lesson for me was if the path is starting to look different than you imagined, that's okay. Um, it may just be leading you to a better opportunity that you hadn't even thought about. So just, again, having your goals, having your mind set on something, but making sure that you're open to other things that may come along the way. I think that's a great... Go ahead. Sorry for interrupting. Uh, Danielle, uh, this is Dan Cernia. Hi. Uh, I, want, I wanted to let you know that I, I concur. Great, excellent, excellent presentation. Oh, thanks. But I, a question comes to mind, and, um, and Emma made me actually think about this question, and that is, what um, advice would you give to those students that are entering a college program Mm -hmm. and have a, have a good idea that they want to get into um, broadcasting, want to get into news. How would you 
uh, what would you suggest for them to focus on in their college career to prepare them best mm -hmm. to then enter into the marketplace right out of college with little delay and um, hit the ground running? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's that's a great that's a great question. So I think some of it depends. I think if you're going into a, a college or a university that has a strong journalism program, the opportunities for you there may be different than someone going into a school that either maybe doesn't have a, a big journalism program, um, kind of like I kind of like I did. So if you're going into a school, let's start with one that has a big uh, you know, broadcast or just a big journalism program in general. I think as much exposure as you can get to, to real life scenarios is the best thing I can say. So whether that's, you know, if you have a um, college newscast or a college uh, TV station, you know, that's something to definitely get involved with. Uh, internships are huge. Um, and actually I, I feel so bad for the students who had summer internships uh, lined up, you know, right now I've been hearing from several of them that, you know, they might not be able to get in for their internships and um, I know they're really disappointed about that because they know how valuable uh, that experience is. Um, making connections any way you can. You know, I've had a students from ASU um, randomly email me out of the blue, hey, you know, so-and-so is my teacher and you work with, so would you mind talking to me about the industry and about the business? Um, and I'm happy to do that. And so finding people who are in the industry to connect with and kind of develop a um, mentor mentee relationship with, I think is very important. And as far as actual, you know, coursework, um, even if you think you want to go into broadcast, making sure that you're also looking at looking at digital, looking at social media, you know, exposing yourself to as many different types of media as possible. I think can only help you in whatever outlet you decide to pursue. All right, thank you so much. Great presentation. Yeah, yeah that course. was great. My pleasure. Okay, I'm gonna record, uh, stop the recording. I'm gonna post this to YouTube. You're welcome to share this. Um, and thank you so much for your time, Danielle. This was great. Yeah, no, thanks guys. Good to see you. <laughs> you too. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye.